Even in the busy marketplace of Athens, he was hard to miss. He stood over by the colonnades, sheltered from the bright afternoon sun. Everywhere in the square, people were hurrying about their business, and the clamor of voices filled the air. Vendors and shopkeepers bargained over fruit and olives with women in long white dresses and sandals. Children raced about chasing balls and boxing with each other. Important-looking men dictated to scribes who sat cross-legged on the ground and scratched out their words on long rolls of papyrus. And slaves struggled to carry the merchandise their masters had heaped into their arms. He seemed very serene amid the activity. He'd been standing in the same spot for hours now, without once growing restless or sitting to rest. Around him, as always, was a group of young Athenian men. They were all watching him intently. Even when someone else spoke, the rest kept their eyes on him, the barefoot old man in the ragged cloak. He would speak sometimes, and then they would be very quiet, very still, as if they mustn't miss a single word or nuance. Then one of the young men would respond, arguing passionately, gesturing with his hands, and finally, in confusion, running his hands through his hair and sighing. And then the old man would speak again, and then there would be laughter. He didn't look like an Athenian, standing amid the lean, handsome, well-dressed youth of his prosperous city. He looked at first glance like a rock among emeralds. In this city that so admired beauty, he was known for his ugliness. He was short and stout, with a broad nose, thick lips, and prominent eyes. But inside this plain and coarse rock was a sparkling diamond, hidden behind the worn-out cloak the clumsy body and the homely face, was the soul of Socrates, philosopher and master teacher of ancient Greece. He was, as his famous student Plato said, all glorious within. Socrates was one of the wisest and most inspiring figures in the history of the West. His teachings marked an important turning point in Western philosophy and influenced human thought and behavior for centuries to come. It was Socrates who turned the attention of the mighty Greeks from the world around them to the souls within them. It was a gift that would cost him his life. Socrates was born near the year 470 B.C. in Athens, which was then one of many city-states in Greece. Athens, once renowned for its vision of democracy, its high ideals, and its brilliant artists and thinkers, had become the most powerful of those states. But its power had led to corruption. Now it ruled Greece like a tyrant, oppressing the smaller states and putting its enemies into slavery. There were 150,000 residents of Athens in the year 400 B.C., and 100,000 of those were slaves. Socrates lived all his life in Athens, leaving only once to serve as a soldier in the war with Sparta. We know nothing of his childhood and very little of his life, because he himself never wrote about it. Most of what we know, we know from Plato. Socrates was born not into a family of privilege like many of his students, but to a family of poor craftsmen. His father was a stonemason, and Socrates followed the same profession. If he was a typical Athenian boy, he was probably taught music, athletics, and the works of Homer, author of the Iliad and the Odyssey. As a man, he was well versed in the classics, and knew the disciplines of geometry and astronomy. As a teenager, he received two years of military training, and after that he was considered an adult. Socrates lived during the time of the Peloponnesian War, a difficult and desperate period of Greek history. The war had been waged by Sparta, another city-state of Greece, that felt Athens had become too powerful. It lasted thirty years, between the time Socrates was about thirty and sixty years old. Both Socrates and his friend Alcibiades took part in the early campaigns. The relationship between Socrates and Alcibiades was complex, special, and significant. Alcibiades was a rich, handsome noble of great personal charm, known for his rapid, persuasive speaking abilities. He was also an excellent athlete, particularly skilled at the chariot. He was the only Athenian whose horses took first, second, and fourth prizes in an Olympic competition. Alcibiades was so admired by the youth of Athens that when he refused to learn the flute for fear it would disfigure his face, 
the flute went out of fashion overnight. Socrates saw many fine attributes in Alcibiades, his courage, his intelligence, his eloquence, just to name a few. But he feared the young man's wealth and power and the constant flattery of the adoring Athenians would corrupt him. Socrates tried hard to influence Alcibiades towards higher values, and for his part, Alcibiades was a willing listener. But he was more interested in learning Socrates' dramatically effective debating techniques, in hopes these would further his career. During the war, the two shared a tent and fought next to each other in battle. In one particularly brutal fight, Alcibiades was wounded, and Socrates threw himself before him, fighting valiantly to protect him. He was forever after credited with saving his friend's life. There would come a time when many in Athens would wish he hadn't. As Alcibiades grew older, he became more ambitious and dissipated. He wore long purple robes like a woman, which trailed after him in the marketplace, and he had a large soft bed installed in the galley of his ship. The Athenians began to lose their respect for him. Then he came up with a rash plan for invading Sicily, and convinced many of Athens' young men to join him. The expedition was a disaster, and when Athens convicted him of impiety, Alcibiades fled to the enemy, Sparta, and told them military secrets of Athens. Ultimately, it would be Socrates who would pay for the betrayal of his friend. During the war, his comrades were amazed by Socrates' extraordinary ability to withstand hunger, thirst, and cold. Even in a severe frost, when all others were bundled in felt and fleeces, or tried to stay indoors, Socrates would be outside clad in his ordinary clothes, walking along the ice in bare feet. As a citizen of Athens, Socrates, like most people, was influenced by the sophists, a Greek term for wise men. Sophists came to Athens from all over Greece to teach in exchange for a fee. At that time, Young, ambitious Greeks were especially interested in preparing themselves for careers in politics, law, or business. The sophists taught them logic, the study of the rules of argument and debate. They also taught them grammar and public speaking so they could be persuasive in their arguments. Some sophists had a broader curriculum that included mathematics, astronomy, poetry, music, and history. Still others taught the interpretation of dreams, a popular subject in Athens, because dreams were believed to be messages from the gods. But the main focus of the sophists was to instruct people in how to think and how to express their thoughts convincingly. The Greeks of the 5th century BC were also beginning to rethink their religion and gods. The character of these ancient gods was much like the character of nature, beautiful and strong, but unpredictable and often cruel. The Greeks were beginning to turn away from the old legends in search of a religion that reflected their own ideas about good and evil. They were on the brink of a change from God to God and from religion to spirituality. The sophists shared many of these views but preferred not to go public with them. They were still unpopular with traditionalists who were some of the sophists' wealthiest employers. Out of this mix of new ideas and interests and old customs and teachings, came a new breed of thinkers who did not accept fees and who felt free to discuss whatever they pleased. They called themselves not sophists, but philosophers, lovers of wisdom. The early philosophers had a variety of different interests and specialties. Many of them went off in scientific directions, developing the first theories of the atom, inventing geometry, and making discoveries about space and the nature of the universe. But all these pursuits were part of the larger pursuit, to understand the human soul, the purpose of life, and the meaning of truth. During these very vital and questioning times, Socrates was supposed to be at home carving stone. He was supposed to be chipping away with his chisel at hard, stubborn pieces of rock, and creating lovely statues and imposing buildings. Instead, he preferred to chip away at ignorance, first his own, and then others. He neglected his business and spent his time in the marketplace or other public and private places in town, discussing ideas with whoever was interested. This was a constant frustration to his wife, Xantippe, who was left at home to raise three sons, virtually without an income. It's not surprising that Xantippe had often been described as a cross, bad-tempered woman who constantly scolded Socrates. 
Socrates, on the other hand, saw Xantippe as a blessing. He said it was good to live with a difficult spouse because then one could learn to manage and live with all others. Early on, Socrates dedicated himself full-time to pursuing wisdom. He himself said this was inspired by a pronouncement made by the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle was a popular and highly respected temple overseen by a priest or priestess who allegedly had the powers of prophecy. The Greeks believed that the gods spoke directly through the priest or priestess, who were only vehicles for a divine message. Over the years, many important figures consulted the oracle in an attempt to discover their destiny, including Alexander the Great. Socrates had a friend who went to the oracle and was told by the high priestess that the wisest man in Greece is Socrates. According to Socrates, he couldn't accept this pronouncement. He hesitated to doubt the oracle, but he felt that although he often wondered about truth, he didn't really understand it. So he decided to find the men in Athens whom he supposed were the wisest, and to question them to assure himself they knew more than he did. After many discussions with these men, he decided he was in fact wiser, because he knew he knew nothing, whereas they, even though as ignorant as he, believed they were wise. Socrates developed the habit of pondering his questions and ideas for hours at a time in an almost trance-like state. A friend who witnessed one of these meditations described it for history. One morning, he was thinking about something which he could not resolve. He would not give it up, but continued thinking from early dawn until noon. There he stood, fixed in thought. And at noon, attention was drawn to him, and the remark ran through the wondering crowd that Socrates had been standing and thinking about something since daybreak. At last in the evening, after supper, some out of curiosity, brought out their mats and slept in the open air that they might watch him and see whether he would stand all night. There he stood until the following morning, and with the return of light he offered up a prayer to the sun and went his way. Socrates went into these deep states of thought or meditations often. Plato called them his rapts, such as in rapt attention. He was a devout believer and lover of God, who always believed his mission came through and from God and left him no choice but to obey. That mission was to reveal to Athens, which he loved dearly, its false values and ignorance. He prayed, but he said his prayer was always the same, Give me what is good. He also referred many times to his divine sign, a voice he had heard from childhood. The voice forbade him to do things, but it never gave him positive suggestions or encouragement. It would also give predictions about good or bad luck, frequently about events that seemed trivial on the surface. In his quest for wisdom, Socrates became well acquainted with sophists. He reached the conclusion that they really didn't care what they taught as long as they could make a profit from it. Furthermore, they often stated as absolute facts that never had been proven. Socrates saw that although the teaching of the sophists provided information, it did not promote real thinking. So Socrates began his own teaching but first he knew he would have to clear away all the falsities and misconceptions in people's minds to open the way for the truth. To accomplish that, he developed a teaching style that has been known ever since as the Socratic method. The Socratic method of teaching is based primarily on a simple question and answer dialogue. It is not a system by which people are told the truth, but by which they discover the truth themselves through their own thought processes. Socrates would start by getting a person to make a statement about something he thought was obvious or true, such as courage is this or loyalty is that. Then Socrates might ask a question, well, if you believe this is true, then that must be true, correct? Certainly, the student would say, and if that is true, does it follow that this is true? Well, yes. The discussion would continue like this until the argument led to a point where the student realized his truth was not at all as obvious as he thought it was, and he would be forced to re-examine the beliefs and opinions he'd once held on to with such force and determination. Socrates believed that within every individual are the resources to answer questions correctly, that truth is there and needs only to be uncovered. Therefore, he could teach simply by asking questions. Socrates used this method of discussion not just with students, but with anyone who challenged him, including some of the leaders of Athens. 
Because their reasoning was so often flawed to begin with, a discussion with Socrates could often lead to frustration and embarrassment. This wasn't his goal. His goal was to clear out outmoded ways of thinking and to encourage people to reason their way towards truth. His goal was to help people to realize their own ignorance. To that end, he would challenge anyone with a pretense of knowledge. Socrates was never rude, never assaultive in his arguments, never annoyed. His own personal feelings never entered into his discussions. Nevertheless, he made many enemies. Athenians, particularly older ones, felt he was challenging their traditions and morals. They felt he was challenging the very principles on which their democracy had been founded. Socrates had no school, no classes, and no salary. As an historian of the time said, he lived in the public eye. At early morning, he was to be seen taking himself to one of the promenades or wrestling grounds. At noon, he would appear with the gathering crowds in the marketplace. And as day declined, wherever the largest throng might be encountered, there he was to be found, talking for the most part, while anyone who chose might stop and listen. One of Socrates' favorite recruiting grounds was the public gymnasium. There he knew he could find the most ambitious of Athens' young men, the ones who would be the city's future. He spent much of his time with young men who showed exceptional promise, and also with politicians, poets, and artisans. They discussed their professions and their ideas about right and wrong. Young Athenians were enthralled by Socrates, and he had great influence over many of them. One of his students told him, Mere fragments of you and your words, even at second hand, and however imperfectly repeated, amaze and possess the soul of anyone who hears them. The Athenian youth who gathered about Socrates began to reevaluate their own lives and commit to a higher, more spiritual ideal. He was more than a teacher, he was an awakener. Socrates was deeply committed to truth and honesty. He felt that falsity was more than a flaw. It created evil in the soul. He spoke a great deal about virtue and knowledge and the relationship between them. He believed that if someone truly knew and understood why something was wrong, he would be unable to do it. He thought it was always worse to do wrong than to be wronged. Eventually, his own words would be put to a deadly test. Some of Socrates' enemies were made for him by his students. Socrates' style was easy to imitate although none could do it with the skill and sincerity of Socrates himself. Several of his young students began to use the Socratic argument to try and demean their elders, particularly authority figures. There was a growing community of Athenians who felt Socrates was a bad influence. The Peloponnesian War ended when Socrates was 60, but it had made a dramatic change in the people of Athens. As it had progressed, there had been many defeats and great losses of life. Both Spartans and Athenians committed grave atrocities. The older generation blamed the young, saying they'd forsaken religion. The younger blamed the old, saying their principles of democracy had failed. Every year the Spartans invaded the countryside of Athens, burning its crops and fields. The people fled to the city where conditions became crowded and unpleasant. Then the great plague hit. For two summers and two winters it brought its horrible, painful death, leaving Athens in the grip of fear and grief. When it subsided, one out of every four Athenians had died. When the war ended in 404 B.C., Athens had been completely defeated. Fortunes had been lost, families destroyed, and ideals shattered. The Spartans moved into the vanquished city and appointed 30 men to rule Athens in a dictatorship. The rulers were tyrannical and executed people without trial. The citizens of Athens so hated these months that they called them the Terror. The dictators were called the Thirty Tyrants. Socrates, well known for his bravery in the early days of the war, had been given two offices of state before the Thirty took command of the city. He refused to participate in any of the affairs of the dictatorship, and even refused to obey when he was ordered to arrest one of its enemies. The man who had given the order was one of his former students, Critias. Following the rule of the Thirty, there was civil war in Athens between the Democrats and those who blamed them for the city's disasters. Democracy was not restored until 399, the very year Socrates died. During all this chaos and discord, Socrates had managed to remain fairly unscathed. He was desperately poor and took no money for his teaching, which took up most of his waking hours. 
He went about barefoot as always, and wore the same old coat, winter or summer. He had no comforts and luxuries in life, a fate he didn't mind in the least. When a friend found him staring at all the various goods in the marketplace one day, he asked why Socrates was interested, since everyone knew he never bought anything. Socrates responded, I am always amazed to see just how many things there are that I don't need. His life was simple, pious, and completely unambitious. But Athens was in a state of suspicion and unrest. All the horrors and betrayals of the last years had left its citizens fearful and wary. Anyone who taught anything new was considered a possible threat. And to them, Socrates was beginning to look like a threat. The two final blows had been unwittingly delivered by Socrates' two former students and friends, Critias, who had been a fiery leader of the Thirty Tyrants, and Alcibiades, the man whose life Socrates had once saved, and who had later betrayed Athens. Both were hated by the Athenians, and both had been friends of Socrates. Socrates was going to be made to pay. The famous trial of Socrates took place before a large jury of several hundred people, who represented the Athenian public. There were two charges against him, that he didn't believe in the gods of the city, and that he had corrupted its young men. There was neither a judge nor attorneys at the trial. Instead, defendants in an Athenian trial were expected to plead their own cases. Usually, defendants hired someone to write a speech for them. Then they came to court in their oldest, worn clothing, accompanied by their spouse and children, who would weep and beg for mercy. This attempt to store the pity of the jury was expected. It was the natural way things were done in an Athenian court of law. But Socrates would have none of it. He would rely instead on truth. He forbade his family to come to court, and he refused to listen to his friends who said he should rise and proclaim his innocence. Instead, he very cheerfully told the story of his life, including the episode of the oracle at Delphi. He said he believed the meaning of the oracle was that God only is wise, and that men's wisdom is worth little or nothing. Therefore, when it said that Socrates was the wisest man in Greece, it meant only that Socrates is wiser than most men, because he knows his wisdom means nothing. He added, And therefore I still go about testing and examining every man whom I think is wise, whether he be a citizen or a stranger, as God has commanded me. And whenever I find that he is not wise, I point out to him, on the part of God, that he is not wise. And I am so busy in this pursuit that I have never had leisure to take any part worth mentioning in public matters, or to look after my own private affairs. I am in very great poverty by reason of my service to God. He also said that he couldn't be held responsible for the immoral acts of Critias or Alcibiades, or any other young men whose misthinking had steered them wrong. He, Socrates, had tried to teach them that they must put the good of their souls before their ambition. Finally, as to why he hadn't brought his wife and children to court and begged for pity, as everyone else did, he explained, Were I to be successful and prevail on you by prayers to break your oaths, I should be clearly teaching you to believe that there are no gods, and I should simply be accusing myself by my defense of not believing them. But Athenians, that is very far from the truth. I do believe in the gods as no one of my accusers believes in them. And to you and to God, I commit my cause to be decided as is best for you and for me. The eloquent and stirring speech made by Socrates in his own defense is called the Apology of Socrates. It left the jury in a very difficult position. Many of them admired him. Others felt indifferently but saw no purpose in condemning an old man of 72. And others were angry. Socrates hadn't played by the rules. He hadn't begged for their pity and mercy. They suspected he was deliberately flaunting his disdain for the court. For the sake of their dignity, they felt they had to condemn him. They did, by a vote of 281 to 220. What remained now was the penalty. The usual procedure was that the accuser demanded a penalty and then the defendant proposed one. The jury then voted between the two. Socrates' accuser asked for death. When the accuser demanded death, Socrates' friends were relieved. They felt such a severe request put Socrates in a very good position. Most of the people who voted against him knew very well he didn't deserve to die. All Socrates had to do was suggest a milder punishment, and surely they would vote in his favor. 
But Socrates, proclaiming he had done nothing wrong, refused to suggest any punishment at all. Instead, to the horror and shock of all, he suggested he be honored. His proposal was that he be given free meals at the town hall, together with Olympic champions and others who had served the state. Frantically, his friends pulled him down back into his seat. Socrates at least offered to pay a fine. We shall pay it for you. So Socrates rose once more and added the postscript that his friends were willing to pay a fine, but he, since he had no money at all, could pay nothing. The jury then took its vote. To the surprise of no one present, it voted the death penalty. Socrates accepted the verdict with perfect calm. He told the jury, I shall go away convicted by you and sentenced to death, and my accusers go convicted by truth of felony and wrong. He then told his friends that what had passed had been meant to pass, and that all was well. Whether life or death is better is known to God and to God only, he said. Most Athenians were unhappy about the verdict against Socrates. Several secretly hoped he would escape. The guard around Socrates was very loose, and his friends came up with a plan for escape that seemed fail-proof. Again, Socrates refused their help. He had lived by the laws of Athens. He would not break those laws now. The jury of Athenians had paved the way for one of the most famous death scenes in history, and the first true martyr to the cause of philosophy. Socrates was taken to prison, where under normal circumstances he would have been executed immediately, but the sacred ship of Athens was away on a voyage, and no Athenian could be put to death during its absence. It would be a month before it returned. It would be a month before Socrates would die. In prison, Socrates was allowed visits from his friends and family. His students came to see him every morning and spent most of the day with him. When his wife, Xantippe, came to him, she wailed about the jury's unjust condemnation of him. Socrates asked in response, Would you prefer it to be just? Then one morning, his friends and students came earlier than usual, for they had learned the evening before that the sacred ship had arrived back in Athens. When they entered the prison, they saw that Xanthippe was already there, with Socrates' youngest child in her arms. She began crying, wailing to her husband, This is the last time, Socrates, that you will talk with your friends, or they with you. Socrates glanced at Crito, one of his closest friends, and said, Crito, let her be taken home. Crito's servants led Xantippe and other female relatives away, Xantippe weeping bitterly and beating her breast. Then Crito, unable to give up hope that Socrates would escape, whispered to him, There is still time. Socrates responded, I shall only make myself absurd in my own eyes if I cling to life. Socrates' friends stayed throughout the day talking. Socrates, over and over, expressed his joy at, in his words, going to the place where he hoped to gain the wisdom that he had passionately longed for all his life. Then Socrates retired to another room to bathe himself. When he returned, he had his three children brought to him and gave them his final directions. After the children were sent away, the jailer arrived and told him the hour of his death had arrived. Weeping, the jailer said, I have found you the noblest and best man that has ever come here and now I am sure that you will not be angry with me, but with those who you know are to blame. And so farewell, and try to bear what must be, as lightly as you can. You know I have come. The jailer left, and a slave boy entered, carrying the cup of poison made from the hemlock. Socrates calmly asked what he should do. He was told to drink the cup, walk around until his legs felt heavy, then lie down and let the poison act of itself. With that, he handed Socrates the cup. Socrates said, I suppose that I may and must pray to the gods that my journey hence may be prosperous. That is my prayer. Be it so. With that, he took the cup and drank. He drank cheerfully, without trembling, without any change of color or feature, as if it were nothing more than a cup of wine. Until this point, his students had been able to keep their composure. But now they all began to weep and sob, saying, as Plato did later, that they felt as if they were about to be orphaned. What are you doing, my friends? exclaimed Socrates. I sent away the women chiefly in order that they might not offend in this way, for I have heard that a man should die in silence. So calm yourselves and bear up. When they heard that, his friends were ashamed and they stopped their weeping. 
Socrates rose and walked around some, but he soon lay down as the numbness began to overtake him. He knew, as they all did, that when it reached his heart, he would die. He then said, Credo, I owe a cock to Aesculapius. Do not forget to pay it. And a few moments later, he was dead. The year was 399 B.C., and he was 72 years old. Wrote Plato later, Such was the end of a man who I think was the wisest and justest and the best man that I have ever known. I could not help thinking that the gods would watch over him still on his journey to the other world, and that when he arrived there, it would be well with him, if it were ever well with any man. Socrates left no writings and no records of his teachings or work. Most of the world's knowledge of him has come from the dialogue of his most famous pupil, Plato. From that dialogue, we know much of the greatness that was Socrates. We know he redirected human thought or philosophy toward an analysis of character and personal conduct. He turned humankind's attention from the study of the way things are and the world about them to the study of virtue and the progress of the human soul. Scientific interests, such as the nature and origin of the universe, expanded to include an interest in moral problems and how people should best live their lives. Socrates was the first to separate the body and the soul and to place higher value on the soul. He was the first also to try and arrive at universal, clearly understood definitions of ideas such as courage, beauty, piety, and goodness. It is Socrates who said, The unexamined life is not worth living. As a man, he was one who refused to bow to tyranny of any kind. He refused to compromise the truth or to renounce his principles, even to save his life. Because of all this, because of how he taught, what he said, and who he was, he remains today, 24 centuries after his death, the very model of the philosopher, the lover of wisdom. This is the end of the session.